Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. And most importantly, my apologies for having to do this virtually and not being able to be part of the panel that I was originally slotted to be in on Friday morning. Uh, but between the conference switching to a virtual format uh, and me not being able to travel, unfortunately, the time slot ended up in a, in a spot where it was just not possible for me to reasonably call in live. Um, my apologies again to everybody in the audience and to the panelists and the moderator. Um, and my sincere thanks to the organizers for letting me do this quick impulse talk uh, and share some thoughts with you. Uh, and I want to start it with by pointing to a resource uh, that came out about a month ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences here in the US, a collection of articles by experts in, in fields ranging from science literacy to information sciences to political science to uh, communication science, looking at misinformation from a wide variety of angles and all the articles are available uh, open access. So I, I encourage you to look at them if, if, if that is of interest. I want to touch on three thoughts in this impulse talk really quickly. Um, and, and, and I phrased this slide, as you can see, intentionally a bit provocatively uh, and, and calling this, this, uh, our discussions of an infodemic as, as a, a white whale and, and, and to, to use a, a Moby Dick metaphor. Um, and, and the reason why I'm being a little bit provocative and, and overstating the case, uh, as, as hopefully you, you realize, is because of a number of related questions that I do actually think, and this is where I'm being more serious, uh, that, that deserve honest answers. Number one, um, are we actually certain that we mo are more in the middle of an infodemic than we have been in the past? And, and aside from the fact that we're using the term very often wrong, the WHO uh, uh, terminology initially didn't refer to a misinformation infodemic, it referred to a, a deluge of an, 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 an overwhelming amount of information that we're having a hard time sorting through. But it's actually unclear if doing COVID, um, the misinformation and disinformation problem was actually more urgent than it was for other areas of politics or other areas of science in the past. And Bill Gates, of course, is a really good example. The idea that he was pushing vaccines for personal gain or population control is not new by any stretch. It's been around for probably well over a decade. It just got reheated and reused for this particular um, issue. More importantly, there's very little evidence and in fact there's evidence to the contrary to suggest that misinformation is directly linked to things that we actually cared about during COVID-19 meaning did we all wear masks did we socially or physically distance um, are we getting the vaccine if it's available to us and the answer is the drivers of those behaviors very often have little to do with information or in fact are utterly unrelated um, to to knowing the science really well so this idea that we're fixing a problem that then will lead to more positive behavioral outcomes is naive at best and wrong at worst. But the third aspect is, is maybe the most important one, and that is that we all have now gotten into this idea that we need to battle misinformation, and we know very little about what the potential side effects and undesirable side effects of that are. We know about the existence of backfire effects. Are they a universal phenomenon? Absolutely not. They don't happen all the time or even in the majority of cases, but they can happen in some cases where giving people more facts make them dig in even deeper if they hold very strongly held priors. But we're also encountering most of this information in digital and algorithmically curated news environments. Even if they're not algorithmically curated, I'm gonna argue, or I would argue, that a lot of the misinformation that ended up being spread, I never saw in its primary source. I, I didn't follow Donald Trump's Twitter feed, for instance, while it was still around. Um, but it was impossible to avoid his tweets, tuning into any newscast, reading newspapers, reading magazines, all of whom went into great depth um, uh, covering his, his tweets and, and, and the sentiment behind them. So we actually have this amplification effect by constantly trying to correct misinformation. We give it a much wider reach on traditional media. And as I said, on digital media with algorithmic curation, of course, we not just amplify its digital footprint because it because if we engage with misinformation, it shows up higher in everybody else's timeline. Um, but we also extend its half-life. It lasts much longer. If nobody engages with a piece of misinformation, it just disappears in the vast emptiness that is the internet. If we all engage with it, it ends up showing up on our Twitter, on our Facebook uh, feeds and, and, and all the other curated um, social media timelines that now dominate most of our news diets. But aside from the fact that 
the infodemic concept is a bit vague, I would argue a second thing, and that is that a, that that our concern about misinformation is actually exacerbated by the fact that during COVID-19, information, really good, solid, reliable scientific, scientific information, was hard to come by. And we knew this ahead of time. This is an article by Adam Marcus and Ivan Oransky, uh, who argued early in the pandemic that science would move really fast and and would make mistakes um, that studies would get retracted that that we would have to roll back um, uh, 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 findings that we thought were certain and, and basically replace them with better science and they said look we're going to be fine as long as we see it coming but of course we didn't see it coming what we did is and this is a really important aspect of COVID and misinformation we corrected misinformation that we knew to be wrong with science that we were not quite certain would turn out to be right. And we may have won battles here and there over misinformation, but we, we certainly risk the, losing the long-term war over what science and war is a bad metaphor here, um, but the long-term war over, over science being our best curator that we have as a society of knowledge. Um, what happened? Well, partly in the, in the US, and, and we saw this in other countries as well, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control uh, made recommendations that went back and forth. Initially, they were concerned about PPE um, running out and, and first responders running out of PPE. So they recommended not wearing masks. Then they switched to saying, well, no, you should wear masks in the general population. You should wear cloth masks. Don't buy up all the all the protective equipment that we need in hospitals. Um, the World Health Organization then, of course, added to that uh, uh, some complexities. Uh, by saying, well, you know, that, that argument of asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic spread is, is, is good, but it's actually very, the, pre, the idea of pre-symptomatic spread is actually very rare. What they meant is not that the phenomenon is very rare. What they meant is that it's hard to demonstrate um, it actually happening. And a couple of days after this, they rolled it back and basically said, no, no, that's not what we meant. By that time, of course, the genie was out of the bottle saying, well, is the science suggesting we should wear masks or is the science suggesting the opposite? Um, Tony Fauci then tried to explain this, even in, 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 in magazines like InStyle, uh, trying to walk people through what the decision making was and why policy had to act on imperfect science or science that was still developing. Um, all of that exacerbated by scientists pretty publicly battling over the validity of studies that suggested one or the other and, and conservative commentators in the US immediately jumping on this. If you read Laura Ingram, Ingram's tweet here, Next time they say trust the science, remember all the studies that they had to retract or the studies that provided questionable data that informed policy. And of course, in Europe, we saw similar things. AstraZeneca has been in the news for a long time now um, uh, over blood clot risks, especially for certain subpopulations. Uh, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel uh, coming out and, 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 and very visibly herself getting the vaccine, but she got the vaccine almost the same week where a couple of countries over or up rather and up north um, said, look, we're not going to use this anymore at all. Uh, again, for a reasonable consumer looking at this, uh, this looks like science not being able to give us clear guidance on, on policy. And so the facts during COVID-19 that we use to correct misinformation themselves have become have, have, have come under public scrutiny. Um, and, and, and that's not a bad thing but it's something that has made our life as communicators uh, much more complicated. Let me end with one third slide, one last slide. Um, and that is a, 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 an important point that I think that we often forget. Um, science does not make policy. It never does. It didn't during COVID and it does on no other issue. Science informs policy. It advises on the facts that underlie policy, but policy by definition is made by people and by policymakers. And that's actually the way it's supposed to be. Tony Fauci spoke to this quite powerfully early on in the Trump administration. Um, but so how do we make certain that, that the best available science does get heard, that, that the best pieces of, of, of authoritative, correct information get heard in, in, in public policy debates? And I wanna talk about four things really quickly. One, the idea of language. How we describe these facts makes it tremendous difference. Um, very often, uh, and this is a, a, a study out of Wharton that, that some of you may have seen in the past, the gray line, and this is not important to read the, the graph, just the, the shape of these two lines. The gray line is from left to right, liberals to conservatives, and their willingness to buy an energy efficient light bulb. 
And you can see there are very little differences between liberals and conservatives. Once you, you put an environmental label on the packaging of that light bulb, it turns into the green line, meaning every liberal gets really excited because they're, they care about the environment and every conservative gets much less excited and is less likely to purchase this light bulb simply because I put a label on them that's at odds with their values. And of course, for COVID, we had some of the same, or we are having some of the same discussions in the US, for instance, where the, the label vaccine passports has been shown to, to really evoke um, uh, ideas of government overreach and, and, and national oversight and data collections that conservatives don't like. Uh, vaccine verification, in contrast, is a term that's much more palatable across the ideological spectrum. So how we talk about some of the facts that we're trying to get across or some of the policies that those facts inform is really important. Uh, this is partly related to how we can speak to values that actually matter to people. The Robert Koch Institute or the CDC are not any different for them. This is a public health issue, and it is. Um, it is a medical issue. It is a scientific issue. But for most in, uh, people in the population, it is not. It is an individual liberties issue. It's an economic issue. It's an issue of personal freedoms. So how can we package a scientific issue in ways that actually speaks to those values? Um, and the idea, for instance, that every day that we're not wearing a mask, we're losing $56 per person not wearing a mask per day in the U.S. in GDP um, is a very strong economic argument. Why? Because by not wearing masks, we cannot reopen more quickly. We cannot get back to normal. We cannot keep stores open, get them up, back up to capacity. So framing issues in ways that speak to those values, individual liberties or, econ or economic values, um, is really important for answering the question that the public is actually asking rather than answering the questions that we as scientists think need to be answered. And then the last thing I think is, is a really important one, and that is uh, we need to start talking about the best available evidence that we have right now rather than the best available evidence, period. Now, because that overclaiming on the best available evidence is what's gotten us into trouble during COVID. Um, what do I mean by that? When we get chemotherapy, when we use chemotherapy for cancer, and we still use that for some cancers, we know it's not the best therapy we'll ever have. We're, we're rapidly working at new therapies, targeted drug delivery, um, gold nanoshells, all these other technologies that will produce much less invasive ways of, of combating and battling cancer, hopefully. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're, that we're, that we're not using it and that, that, that patients don't accept it because we're saying, well, science is, is constantly working on better solutions. Right now, this is where we are. And this is what we can offer you. Hopefully down the road, we'll have experimental things that, that work even better. Um, but the exact same thing we should have done for COVID, saying we're pushing this, we're doing this as fast as we can, um, and new science will come out. But for now, this is the best available science we have to inform policy. And as, it, as, as that science changes, we'll adjust policy. This is where our last problem comes in, and that is that we all are looking for magic bullet solutions. Uh, there are lots of different schools of thought in the social sciences saying you need to consensus message, you need to inoculate the public, you need to do all these things, all of which are pre on pretty shaky empirical ground. Um, they typically are pushed by different teams of researchers that are really, that are trying to offer single intervention solutions. Um, and in a highly complex information environment like, like 2021, like the, the, the global community in 2021, that is not just intuitively naive, it's actually empirically just wrong. And it's actually dangerous by, by claiming that we have simple solutions for very complex problems. So I just want to leave you with that. I think it's a complex problem that requires exactly the kinds of discussions um, that we're having and, and we're having yesterday. And, and hopefully by the time you see this, are having today on Friday. Um, so I, I'm, I'm excited uh, to learn a lot from this, this conference. And again, with my apologies and my deepest gratitude for you letting me uh, do this online. Um, looking forward to hopefully before too long connecting with with all of you in person. Thank you so much.